please welcome them to the stage. Okay. Welcome everybody. We appreciate those who have braved the rain and come out to hear us today. So whoop whoop for the brain, the rain bra brave brave people. We're gonna we're gonna bear through the rain. We're gonna speak clearly so you can hear us. We thank you for being here. I'm Rochelle Franklin. I'm the president and COO of Uniworld Global. Uh, we have brought together a panel of experts, and I think you're going to get some insightful insights today. One of the biggest challenges that marketing leaders have is navigating the intersection of global, local, and now personal. For a long time, if you've been in this game a long time, it wasn't even a consideration. You know, brands would really trying to take their business global, and localization wasn't a thing. At most, they would translate a language. If they're doing retail, make sure it's in the local currency, and that was about it. Then we went through a phase of the mantra, think global, act local. And, and everyone was trying to do that in practice. Some did it well. Some did it not so well. You would see everything from just the Rainbow Coalition, as I call it, in advertising. You do a big global spot with lots of different people, but it didn't resonate culturally. Some brands did it well. I was at Motorola at a time when 70% of our sales were outside the US, and I think we got it right. We did a great job of building a global brand with a lot of local relevance. And I think there were some brands that did it well, but a lot did not, and a lot still aren't. I don't know if, you know, we're advertising people. If you look at advertising today, I'm shocked sometimes at what I see. It's like, really? Like, who bought that? You know, because it's talking to everybody, but it's talking to nobody. So a lot of people fell short. But those who didn't, those leaders like the ones we have here, they know that the recipe to solving this paradox of building global brands with localization is about communication, collaboration, and compromise. It was easier years ago because everything was easier. It didn't feel like it was easy. It felt really hard, but if you look at what's happening today with the democratization of technology, with content that's not just generated by you as the brand owner, but by users. So you don't have control. And media is fragmented. And it's always on. It's 24 seven. The market and the media is always on. So this Solving this paradox is dynamic. It changes from one day to another, one month to another, one year to another. And so what we're gonna do today is explore this idea of how we're solving the paradox and how you can successfully solve the paradox of localization and maintaining a global presence, particularly in reaching the diaspora across Africa and the rest of the world. So, let's jump into it. Today, we got, some, we got some good people on this stage. We have experts, and we're gonna let them share their pearls of wisdom and give you some tips and tools to take when you go back home, which a lot of us are going back home soon. I wanna introduce, from my left, Greg Edwards, President and CEO, of Uniworld Group, Inc. Carlo Morrison, the group CCO, CEO and Chief Creative Officer of Two Tone Global. Intabi Motswanik, Chief Marketing Officer, Perno Ricard Africa and the Middle East. She's our resident client. <laughs> and Steve Babaeko who's the CEO and Chief Creative Officer of Extreme Ideas out of Nigeria. 
So we're going to break this up in some, some segments. So the bigger paradox we've kind of put out there. We're going to go deeper into smaller paradoxes that are challenging agencies and clients who are all trying to solve the problem. So we're going to start with this idea of global and local team tension. For those who are in global roles, I'm sure every day you hear, you don't understand my market. This doesn't work in my market. It's a battle, right? Because you have to hear them, but there are some things, again, it's that communication, collaboration, and compromise to build a global brand while growing in the local market. So, in Tabi, as our resident client <laughs> who lives this every day, and the CMO of the largest uh, spirits company in the world, how do you work to relieve this tension and get internal teams aligned so you can successfully navigate the complex cultural landscape of large and diverse Africa markets while building this global brand equity for Pernod Ricard's many brands? I guess for me, it starts off with um, trying to understand the local context. As much as we're global brands, global brands also have to accept that to be able to enter a market, you need to fully understand what are the people thinking, saying, and, and, and feeling. And for, for local teams, the biggest challenge is trying to get your global counterparts to understand that. And what I found the best way to do this is to school them. But it means that you need to understand your consumer and your context way better. And be able to also, the compromise is a big thing, and, and, and we often end up having to do that. So what we generally tend to do as a team when a new global expression comes in, because we know the natural instinct is going to be, no, you don't understand my consumers. African consumers are not homogenous. There's a West African um, consumer. You get the East African consumer, you get Southern African consumers, and you also get a, a flavor of the Francophone and then the Lusophone, and it's, it's a whole melting pot. But the first thing I always say to the team is, okay, what if the work could resonate? Let's try and identify that first. Because try and see it from that perspective. Because at some point, you're going to be in a global role, and you need to be able to be have the ability to see different perspectives and not always see things from one perspective. Because once you've seen it from the other side, it becomes easier to then tell your global peeps, how does this land locally? But another thing for me, I think that also helps is the kind of relationships you have with your agency partners. It really has to be a partnership because you are not able to tell that story and convey it in a way that someone that is sitting in say Paris or Atlanta is gonna understand it unless you've got strong agency partners that are keeping you in check and reminding you this is how this work could potentially land and this is where we may not necessarily have any resonance. Yeah, let's, let's explore that agency partner thing. You know, what you've got on the stage is three agencies that all um, support Pernod Brands in their resident markets, so they are your partners. How are you leveraging and working together with these partners to break down the inherent silos that we know exist? You know, they clearly exist on the client side. We talked about that in compromise, but they also exist on the agency side, you know, because everybody has to get in their box and do their thing. And sometimes, even if you bring them together, which big brands generally do, they still go right back into their silos and somehow the brand gets lost in the shuffle or the platform doesn't get integrated in a way that works against the objective. So can you talk about how you're working to resolve that challenge? Yeah, that's my favorite one because you'll brief agencies and you'll say, just 
one area you believe you're great at. No, 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 we can do one, two, three, four, up to number 10. But it's like, but guys, pick one. And a more recent one, um, you were part of that integrated brief on Jamison. One of the agencies um, came through to me and said, because the brief that we gave out was, for this workshop, we want you to pick one superpower. We know you may have one all the way up to 10, but this is the group of people that are gonna be in the integrated brief workshop, because we like to workshop the briefs with the team. And she was baffled, because she's like, but I can do this. And I said to her, who else is going to be in the room? What do you think agency A or B is gonna pick as a superpower? Because they can do what you do as well. And then try and identify for yourself, out of the 10 superpowers you have, which one has not been chosen, which specialization has not been chosen, and show up with that. And it's about understanding the context and who's gonna be in the room, what part are they gonna want to own, and try and hazard a guess, and then identify for yourself what's the best of your superpowers to show up with where you can be strong. And, and it may be this superpower now, the next brief, or the next ask from the client might be a different superpower, but there's no ways you're gonna show up at every single one of them and show up strong for the brand and without losing the brand in the process. It's difficult, it's not the easiest. No, I, I love that and that's a, that's a unique and um, innovative way to try and break down those silos. I don't know if Carlo or Steve wanna add a little bit of that perspective in terms of you know, how they receive that and how they work through that. Well, definitely, thank you, Thabi, for that. You know, uh, the, the metaphor I always share with my team when it comes to all of those silos that exist, either between you and the client or amongst agency group, is like picture an accident on the highway. Two cars ram into each other, and both drivers step out of the car, and they're both arguing about who has the right of way. Meanwhile, there's a passenger that's been injured in the car. <laughs> Nobody is paying attention to the bleeding passenger, but we are claiming the right of way. And that is what happens when the brand starts to suffer. The brand is bleeding. We are arguing in our little silos about who has more superpower and who doesn't. So at the end of the day, we are all servants of the brand, and it behoves of us to just come together and build a brand no matter how we say so. At the end of the day, I'm always pushing for co-creation, either with the client or amongst the agency network. I love that, I love that. All right, so we're gonna move on to another paradox that happens, and that is deep data versus meaningful cultural insights. So organizations, as we know today, everybody's data-centric. They're collecting vast amounts of data with the belief that more is better. More data is gonna give you better insights. But the sheer quantity of data is leading to really information overload. And a lot of cases, it's void of cultural understanding. So Greg, UWG has made major investments in building the largest US database of multicultural consumers. How are you using cultural data to shape meaningful global advertising strategies and creative platforms? So that's a great question. So first I wanna just let everyone know how honored I am to be up here with these heavy hitters. These are, these are the people who are, are making things happen um, and doing it really well. So really. Um, so Uniworld, we, we've been in business now 55 years. We're the longest standing multicultural agency in, in America. Now with our new partnerships, in fact, we now believe we're the longest standing multicultural agency in the world. Um, we have a great partnership in our UWG Africa team. We have a great partnership in our UWG Canada team and we'll soon be expanding into places like Brazil and, and even the UK. And what's really important in this process is that for multicultural or for cultural agencies to exist, they now have to have a new toy, and that new toy is called data, right? For many years, we had these great creative inspirations and ideas, and clients liked the ideas, but we couldn't prove that the idea could drive business. We could prove that it could drive culture, 
But then our clients started saying, well, you, you've got to drive my business. So we went out and invested, five years ago, we went out and invested um, quite a bit of money into understanding what did cultural data mean. So we built a, a database in the US of 175 million total data points. And of those data points, 65 million of them are multicultural. So it means that when we walk in and talk to our clients, we're talking to them about not just data, but culture. And what's really important in the conversation of data that most companies miss and don't understand is data is about contextualization. Most people have a lot of information. I walk into every room every time, and people can hit you with reams and reams of data. What they can't hit you with is that one cultural insight that can transform our client's business, right? And Todd and I, was having, we were having a conversation earlier, and she asked me a question. She said, look, you know, give me an explanation of what you call a cultural shift. And I said, well, I'm going to make it something we can all relate to. Let's, let's talk about music. And in particular, let's talk about hip hop. You know, from a one block, probably one building thing in the Bronx, something that became a global phenomenon. In fact, I was laughing this morning. I was listening to something, and it was Russian hip hop. <laughs> because culture cannot be closed. It will show its way and show its place. If you think about what's happening in Afrobeats right now, right? Think about Afrobeats. You know, and, and Carla and I argue about this all the time. Carla doesn't feel that Afrobeats is a legitimate music form. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, it's, I'm a piano. <laughs> so, Afrobeats I love. And so, and what I said to Carlo is, I said, look, here's our reality. So what does data mean? Data is the contextualization, right? We all know that there's something happening, but from a standpoint of something happening meaningfully, we know that Afrobeats are now showing up in American gospel music. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a trend. That is a cultural transformation. It will transform the way we do business. It'll transform the way in which brands expect people to interact with their, their products. It will change the way people expect brands to show up. And all of that is measurable and tangible through data. So at, at Uniworld, we focus on making sure that we give our clients hard facts but we also contextualize those, those, those facts for them. Yeah, I love that because I think, I think it, you made a point and I want to just amplify that. Consumers are demanding, demanding that you show up in a culturally relevant way. It's not a nice to do anymore. It's a have to do if you're gonna build a global brand, if you're gonna build a local brand. So uh, I love that. I think that's a great, a great takeaway. And it segues nicely into the next question. I mean, you, you mentioned you know, African culture influences global culture. We know that. We're, we're all in the room. We understand. We're living it. So from music to sports, right, to food, to fashion, I mean, come on, guys, we're in cans. This is a colorful, colorful cans. And we see our culture influencing and attracting all kinds of people. People want to be in the room where we are because it's where culture is happening. So, and look at this room. We've got people from all over the world, people from across the diaspora, points across Africa, the UK, Europe, Brazil, the US. So the question is, why do you think the time is now to connect the diaspora around the world? And what do you think the role of data and insights is going to play in doing that? So for me, you know, we, we started doing business in Africa as an agency, what, a year ago? We, it's been a year. I, I think we're on our year anniversary. And we always wanted to, to be global, but we also wanted to be global in the right places. And, you know, I jokingly say that, you know, as we, you know, we look at contemporary culture, we say, you know, what did Black Panther mean, right? T to me, Black Panther meant that the world finally recognized that the very, the very existence of the world starts on the continent. That it wasn't just about a movie, it was about a recognition of the power and beauty and importance of people on that continent and what they really were doing to the world. 
And then at the same time, we start to see certain little, you know, we talked about this data shifts, right? We start to realize that in the U.S., the fastest growing immigrant population is people from Africa. That's a little data point that we don't talk about openly in the U.S., right? All of a sudden now, there are more Africans coming in as immigrants than ever before. Then you start to see that same thing happening around the globe. And the importance and influence of Africa becomes even more important. And it became important for us as an organization to understand where the culture, or the, now the new origin of culture was coming from. And for us, it's about, it's time because everyone, including the people of Africa, now recognize their, their power. And, and can you just talk a little bit about how data, which you know, most people will say, I mean, there's no data in Africa, right? Of uh, Brazil um, conversations, there's no data in Brazil. But we know, you know, if there's not any today or if there's not coalesced from different sources, it will be. Mm -hmm. It will be in the future because who's going to demand that? The client. The client is going to demand that we have data. If, true, if you're truly global, we know in more mature markets, data is driving decision making. So how, how do you think that data is going to influence this kind of connection of the diaspora, and how do you envision that playing out? So for us, and, and I, you, you've been handling this for us directly since your day coming here, is the development of what we are calling a uniculture intelligence network in Africa, right? Um, we've, we've been on the continent now a year professionally, and we've been starting working with our partners in understanding two things, what data we should be understanding and where we're gonna get the data from. Um, for, a lot, for a long time, I think that the conversation on data was, was relegated to something that was secondary, but now because Africa is a cultural influencer, we need to understand what's happening in Africa in terms of what it'll do to impact the world. And so the gathering of the retention and the, and the understanding of that data is more important. And that requires, from, from our standpoint as a company, it requires us to invest in now building new data tools for Africa. Now the, beautiful, the beauty of all this is, at the same time, we're in a world that now has more technology than ever, and it's going to help us in this, in this journey um, and, and be beneficial for us. Because you all know in the past, sometimes technology hasn't always benefited us. You know, I, I sit in many meetings and I talk about the future AI, and I remind people all the time that the problem with AI is garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put the right images and the right perspectives in, you don't get out the right things. So now it's important to build data, you know, to really understand African data and then leverage that to now not just impact what we're doing on the continent, but to impact the world. Africa, you know, from my perspective, Africa's the world. And so that understanding is important for us because it now helps us shape the way we go to market in other places. I, I just want to throw it out to the rest of the panelists. I really, the now part is like important because everything's about timing. So does anybody else want to add from their perspective, why now is the time? to connect the diaspora. I, I just open it up to, to any three of you guys to chime in. I, th I, th I think um, Greg said it earlier, and I, I think the right word is culture cannot be contained. I think the age old saying is that, um, and let's bring it back to branding, is that it's not what we say it is, it's what they say it is. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of come full circle. Uh, we kind of know around the history of colonialism and also that appropriation of that culture that happened with all of that. And it's, 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 it's literally coming home to roost where culture is coming back home. And I think that is why now you look at um, music, you look at visual arts, you look at, um, Greg mentioned Black Panther. Black, Black, Black Panther was... In, in, in my view, was a fictional form of representation of how culture can be reinstated to the world. And, 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 and I feel like it's, it's about time that we, we look at it in a way of, not just from a commodity point of view, but also from a value add point of view, because I think there's a lot of taking kind of history around how, how we appropriate culture uh, globally. 
but it's more around how we add value to the world right now. I'm, and if you if you look at the streets of Cannes, and you said it's it's so colorful, I've, I've, I I was shocked with the amount of African American people in one space yesterday. I'm like, I, I've been in Harlem, and there was there were more white people in Harlem than I saw in the restaurant yesterday. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on, right? And and it, it's, it's not that we're trying to take over, it's, we're actually trying to give back. It's, it's, it's a weird thing, like we're giving back, I, I think like we should be receiving back, but it, it's like we, we're actually giving back. We're giving our culture to the world, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's um, and, it's, and it's to be celebrated. And, and the word is being tossed around very loosely everywhere, and I think it's ours to own. Yeah. You know, shame on us if we don't, right? So I want to now shift to this idea of global, global segmentation and localization. I mean, we know that there are lots of global segments that have ties that, that bind us around the world, but that, those segments sometimes kind of get us in uh, middle of the road kind of look at markets and you've got to localize the segmentation in order to get to the deeper insights, the cultural insights that, that allow you to do really localized marketing across all channels, across all mediums. So I want to first start by giving this man his, his flowers. The person that um, is sitting to my far left, if you didn't know, is the first Nigerian agency, Extreme Ideas, to win a Cannes Lion, and they won last year in 2023. 20, and he will not be the last, but they were the first. Um, and we are so proud of you and so happy for you and your agency. Um, your agency is known as a creative agency, clearly, they won a Cannes. Um, who really takes innovative approaches to advertising. And for those who have not had the opportunity to spend time on the continent to really understand how diverse it is within itself, right? Um, can you share with us some of those unique cultural influences of our Nigerian brothers and sisters um, and West African consumers and how you take those and, and, and translate those uh, in unique and innovative ways for global segments that you can turn into really culturally relevant localized executions. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for the opportunity. I, I'm super excited to just be here and just to share some of my uh, little stories that we have. You know, I think these days when I have the opportunity to confront clients and have dialogue with them, I always make one thing very clear. In this age of hyper-nationalism, when it comes to an open confrontation between globalization and localization, to the audience we are trying to win their hearts, localization always wins. And once you understand that, the rest is easy, you know, because at the end of the day, you're not trying to create all this communication for yourself. You're trying to create to win uh, the hearts of a particular sub-segment of, segment of an audience population. And that we say something that's very, very uh, important for us to understand. I mean, for most people, Africa is just a country. <laughs> it's not. Africa is a bloody continent, even if we have to keep retreating it. And even when you now come down to, say, a country like Nigeria, Nigeria is the most populous black nation on Earth, over 220 million people. The city Lagos where I live is over 22 million residents. So it's a, it's a huge city. And I'm sure if you now break down Lagos into like streets, district and everything, the cultural nuance will be different. So how are you able to just deep dive and go and break down and go granular to be able to identify segment types clans, culture, and be able to speak to them in the language that you understand. And that's what Extreme Ideas is about. I mean, we started in Lagos in 2012, and uh, in the 12 years of our history now, we're in, we, we have presence in about seven other countries. 
And the same thing we are preaching, we've always preached in Lagos, it's the same thing we are preaching in all of those countries. Uh, we, we, we had a camp campaign in, uh, from our Zambian office that's actually shortlisted for Act Responsible, another side show in Cannes this year. So we're always trying to see how do we connect with the people we are trying to talk to. I'll give a, a little example of a, a brand we worked on uh, way back early in, in, in when we just started. Uh, at Salat, and uh, when they came to Nigeria, to, it's a telco brand. They, they just brought this commercial from Egypt. Oh no, you, you guys, take this ad and just run it. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Uh, Egypt and Nigeria, uh, <laughs> it's not even close. It's not even in the same ballpark at all. So we are not gonna go this way. We are gonna create something that Nigerians can identify with and will resonate with them. Uh, it was a hard fought argument, but eventually they listened. And I can tell you that was one of the most successful campaigns in terms of we launched the campaign when the brand did not even have one single SIM card to sell, and we, we had already won the hearts of the consumer. So, uh, and, and then now talking about current telco client that we have, Glow, how do you tap into a huge culture like Nollywood? They, it, it has its own flavor, it has its own character, the way the stories are told. So when you see a Glow commercial on CNN, it's been deliberately crafted to tap into the zeitgeist of what Hollywood culture is all about and because the people understand it and they can relate with it and how do you use that to win the hearts of consumers. So it's always going to be about that. And at every point, it is how do we continue to appropriate this culture for ourselves because you did make a point. It's going to be a shame if after everything we've done, building this culture and raising it to this global status will lose control. Because again, I, I tell, even when I have the opportunity to speak to global audience, I say, it's good to talk about uh, diversity and inclusion, but the end, of the, the end point, the end goal for me will always be economic inclusion. Who owns control of the culture? If we are not owning it, then we're losing it. I, I love that, and let's give, give cheers to that. Um, I, I just want you to touch on something before I get to the next question, because I think it's important, um, especially when you get into Africa and you have agencies serving. I mean, one of the reasons why, and one of our goals is to connect independently black-owned agencies, because we believe, and we know, I'm not even going to say we believe, we know that they have longer more, better, more better, we got more better, more better ties to these very local markets where really culture is happening and the connection has to be made. And I think some of the bigger agencies who are not black owned, somehow they don't, they don't, they're not there. They don't understand that level of deep cultural insights. Can you, can you speak to that and, you know, why black agencies are so important in this effort? Well, thank you so much. Uh, there's something, when you come to Nigeria or some parts of Africa, uh, there's, there's a term for an indigenous person who belongs to that local area. You are either referred to as son of the soil or daughter of the soil. You might hear that phrase and just think and overlook it, but it carries way deeper meaning. If you are son of the soil, you're rooted in that environment. You're not strange to that environment. People respect you. And in Africa, just from your surname, your last name, they can already try to trace your genealogy and your history. So it's important. I, I think what most of the global agencies have tried to do, and I'm, I dare say unsuccessfully, is to build a local African network. You know, I've been in talk with, with the position that I hold, I've been in talk with a few global agencies trying to do a deal to say, let us bring you to Africa because we speak Africa, we understand Africa, we understand the different dimension, the nuances of the culture. We are the ones that can create the work that can speak effectively to the people. But no, you want to come and bring some of your ideology because it's worked in the West, you think you can shoehorn it and make it work in, the, in, in Africa, it's not gonna work. And they've seen that. And, and so, but I, I keep telling them though, that even though the deal has not worked, we've not been able to work out a deal with you, but I keep telling them, 
if it's not working today, I can guarantee you one thing. I'm not going to be sitting on my black ass because the next time you come and we want to talk about this deal, I'll be not in seven countries, I'll be in 13 countries and you have to pay more money to do that deal. All right. I love it. I love it. We're going we're gonna to tie this section up with one last question. You know, this, 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 we are at Cannes Lions. Festival of Creativity, you are clearly uh, a creative force in the industry. And we know Africa has, if, if people in the audience does, don't know, the fastest growing, youngest population of any continent, any continent, with 60% of the population under 24. So we know everybody want youth, most of the youth is going to be coming from Africa. So I know that you are focused and committed to bringing up the next generation of, of African creatives. So what do you think needs to be done to nurture that generation who are really going to become you know, the next Steves, and, but the standard bearers of what is fresh and innovative in global youth culture? Ah, well, this is something I'm very, very passionate about. If you have all day, then we can talk about it. <laughs> you know, because for us at Extreme Ideas, there's this uh, uh, program we have called e Extreme Ignite, in which we just try to take young people who are fresh out of college and give them the opportunity. You, you, we get uh, entries from like about a hundreds of people, and then we select the best 12, and then we, we nurture them through a one-year program, and then we release them to other agencies. I, I think it's important that we understand that the biggest asset Africa has today is not the gold, it's not the oil, it's not the mineral resources, it is the human resource. Because the future of global workforce actually may depend on Africa, and that's why if we lose the opportunity to build the young workforce, we have lost everything. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're gonna to move to our last section and we're gonna talk about authentic versus artificial intelligence. And uh, Carlo, Carlo Morrison, the CEO of, of Two-Tone Global, uh, has had his agency for 23 years. He's been working globally uh, for that period of time. And we talked about Africans not being monolithic. Um, so Carlo, what strategies do you employ to ensure that authentic intelligence is considered and is part of building global campaigns when targeting diverse audiences across Africa? Thanks, thank you again. Thanks, uh, Steve. Steve touched on a lot of those points. But I, I'll say this, as... Um, as an agency that started when I was 24 years old, uh, this is crazy actually, um, and Steve speaks about the value of youth um, on the continent, you realize that the, the competition, the, the Goliath that you're facing, that we're facing daily, uh, and back then, if, if I have to go back 23 years ago, that was 2001, it was literally seven years after a baby democracy. We were seven years old out of uh, apartheid. And the, the global entities, the multinational entities, and the old boys club entities had an advantage of capital. They had an advantage of control. And they had an, had an advantage of access. We had to deploy one thing. We had two things that counted for us. Culture, obviously, nuanced understanding. And back then, uh, it wasn't a clear, a clear cut understanding. You, you mentioned global, local. There were all these weird, uh, nonsensical buzzwords that had no depth. But what we had to do was rely on technology. And as a creative myself, I'm, I'm from the trenches. I'm not, I'm not a writer. I'm an art director designer. So the technology, I was run about, I was part of that first wave of real um, technologically reliant uh, workforce in the, in the industry. So we were the first guys to use the tools, right. a Mac or a Mac old gray box 
that uh, the maximum size of a of a file was 50 megs, and then your machine kind of wanted started flames started coming out of it. That's 20 meg files in 2001, guys. So we we're dealing with terabyte files nowadays that we can literally just zip across uh, uh, the cloud. Now we had to rely on on on, on technology, and 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 the one thing that we started doing was deploying and working with uh, the guys from from uh, Apple, finding great solutions with them at the time. Um, the first person to bring in Apple to South Africa was actually an Indian guy, Gav Color, And he worked, he, he used Two-Tone as a guinea pig with the latest technology at the time. So technology is, is kind of what thrusts the youth into into that orbit of progress. If you look at it today, TikTokers, you, you, yourself, last night we were sitting at dinner and you were comparing notes with, um, with one of our clients or future clients, uh, I had a little brother is 19 years old and your son is 23 years old and I don't wanna say the amounts of money these kids are making. They're making a lot of money. And we're talking about technology thrusting us into, if I was 24 years, you know, if I look at my ambition 23 years ago, and what kids are doing with technology today, it's amazing. And that's how you kind of ride the wave of progress by really enhancing and embracing it. And um, you know, 23 years later, being in a few different countries, having global partners like yourselves, it's, it's, it's amazing how you can just integrate purely just by tapping into it. Yep, and, and to, to follow up on that, I mean, technology will always kind of push us forward, push the boundaries, and right now we are in the, the stage and the phase of AI. And I think Greg mentioned like, yeah, you know, AI is great, but there's human biases. You know, it's created by humans, so therefore it has human biases. So the solutions that we see can't always reliably distinguish between what's biased and what's unbiased uh, material, nor do they understand the nuances, the authenticity, the authentic nuances of human desires and emotions to construct their responses. So, you know, we may put some stuff in and we may ask good prompting questions, but yeah, the system's got what it's got. If it's filled with biases and it doesn't have those nuances, what's going to output from that system may be inauthentic, right? And that's where the human element comes in. So how do you, Carlo and Two-Tone, um, envision AI changing the business going forward? Because there's a lot of conversations around well, creatives are gonna be out of work, AI is gonna do all that, and it's gonna take this over, and AI is gonna do all that, and people are gonna lose their jobs. And I think, you know, <laughs> I think whenever we've had technological progress, yes, jobs do get lost, but we gain some benefits and, and, and we, you know, move forward. So talk about how you see AI, how you envision AI changing the business going forward. It's, it's here to stay. End of story. Uh, I, I think let's let's let, let's look at it like this, right? Um, AI right now, and there's other technologies to kind of use as a reference, but I'm going to use um, two crayons in the hand of a two-year-old. That's what AI is right now to us, to all of us, and it kind of looks at us at a situation where we we are still primitive in its stage. I think what we don't know, we fear normally, but it, there's, a, there's a sense of embracing. Um, if we don't look at embracing it, we, 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 we're falling behind. We're falling way behind. You look at the youth today when it comes to how they identify themselves. Some youth identify themselves in a virtual space, not in a real space. Now, if we don't embrace AI, how are we gonna communicate to them? Culture has shifted and evolved in such a way where is it's a hybrid between realism and virtual space. And virtual space is how many 21-year-olds, 18-year-olds identify the, with themselves only in a form of a filter, 
right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't talk to someone in that virtual space right now, because some of us, some of them, uh, Generation Alpha, are going to live probably 50, if not more, percent of their time in a virtual space. Now, how are you going to do that without AI? That tool is the bridge to connect with that new market. So, evolve or die. I, I agree. I agree as a technologist. So, so we've we've uncovered and delved deep into some of the paradoxes, and you know, hopefully, you don't think this is all talk. That there's some takeaways that you got, and so to kind of help to jog your memory when you leave here today, because I know you all are in information overload. I'm just going to kind of summarize some stuff. So, Intabi talked about and she talks specifically to those agency partners in the room who she relies on to solve this paradox. Um, know your superpower. Know your superpower. Greg, he shared with us, look, cultural data is crucial for the authentic brand connection. So data alone is not enough. It needs to be contextualized and it needs to be I'm going to do another word, culturalized, <laughs> all right? Um, Steve, he's a creative, but he's a businessman. He said, we need to be about economic inclusion. And Carlo wrapped it up. We're going to evolve or we're going to die. So if that, don't, <laughs> if that don't give you a sense of urgency, I don't know what will. So we're going to wrap it up. And we're going to do a fast round, really quick. Myths versus reality. We talked a little bit about the myths of Africa. Poor Africa. You know, Africa is what we see in the media. And it's such a crime, because it is not at all what the media portrays. There's a lot of misperceptions about the continent and what's going on on the continent. So we're just going to debunk them real quick. So Carlo, the myth is that Africans don't have access to modern technology. Debunk it. You, you've been to Joburg, right? Oh, I have been. Yeah. That shit, shit works. <laughs> shit works. <laughs> so, it does. <laughs> it does. I, I, I'll give you the myth. And I tell a lot of people this story. The myth started uh, in 1984, I think. 1984, 1983, the biggest, the largest social media influencer campaign of all time. I don't think anyone's ever reached that, not even any of the social media campaigns that are out there right now. It was, it was called We Are The World. Do you guys remember that song? We Are The World. It had the biggest influencers of all time in one space, from Quincy Jones to Rod Stewart to Bruce Springsteen to Michael Jackson, Tina Turner, all of those people had the biggest influence culturally on the world, right? Mm -hmm. Now look at all of that. And what did they show in the background? Flies in the mouth of African babies with big bellies. And you guys believe that shit. <laughs> and you still do. That's why you think we don't work. We work. So that's the myth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Steve, he kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but the myth is that there's no arts industry in Africa, the most creative place in the world. But again, that's so far from reality, isn't it? I mean, uh, today, Nollywood is perhaps arguably the second largest film industry in the world. Afrobeat, from the heart of Lagos and the rest of Nigeria is taking over the world. You have an artist like Bonner Boy, grew up in Nigeria, raised in, Niger in Nigeria. He will go up to New York and shut down the Madison Square Garden. You can count how many American artists that can shut down the Madison Square Garden on one finger. So if that's not art, I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right now. Greg, please, please debunk this myth. Africa's not that big. <laughs> it's not that big. It looks small. So I was uh, in a panel a few months ago, and it was interesting. It was a um, travel group, and 
they had this map up, and it was a map of the world. And um, Africa was this little space on this map. And in fact, what's funny about it was the United States, um, Russia, and a few other places were like the same size as Africa. <laughs> and so I said, you know, I don't think that's right. I said, I'm pretty sure those countries can all fit in Africa together. And the gentleman said to me, well, most people don't know that. We were doing this because creatively it conveyed a way that the world looked like it was all one happy place. And my response was, happy from whose perspective? Mm -mm -mm. Africa, let's be very clear, from a uniworld perspective, Africa is the world, okay? It's a big place. And Tabi, you're gonna wrap up this rapid fire and we're gonna do some questions and answers. Oh, this one is good. Africa is a poor country and it will always be a poor country. First of all. And, 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 and hear me, mm. I say country. I, I, <laughs> and that's where I'm going. First of all, it's not a country. And interesting fact to leave you with. The fastest growing cognac category is in the African region. We're drinking better. It's not just the volumes. We're drinking better and more expensive. All right. Well, thank you guys. Of course, I knew you were gonna be fantastic. And do you guys think that was great? Did you get some insights or you got some takeaways? I don't know, Thomas, do we have five minutes at all? Five minutes? I think we started about five after 10. What we got? Adrian, we got two minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you. And by the way, that's Adrian Smith. She is the visionary of this place. Thank you for realizing your vision and thanks to Juan Woodbury for building out such a, a warm and, and inclusive environment. All right, we got one question. Does any, who wants it, who wants it? Come on, don't be shy. Oh, come on guys, were y'all partying at club quarantine last night so much you can't figure out a question to ask? Ooh, we gotta take her. Uh, because of the miseducation that often goes on most deeply in African American communities about Africa, how do you see bridging the gap between Africans and Africans in the diaspora, which are often suffering from a certain miseducation about where they're from, the cultural nuances. How do you see those bridges being gapped? So, so I'll make this comment from, a, from an African-American perspective. One of the things that I think is important for us is to understand that evil has a single playbook. It's really interesting. When you think about how evil contextualizes itself, it, uses the, pretty much the same playbook, right? So the irony is, in both locations, we still have the same battles. When Uniworld started you know, 55 years ago, it was about giving a voice to the voiceless and in demarginalization, right? It's the same reason why we started UWG Africa. The first three components of what made UWG Africa what it is, is first is to find and employ black youth. Get them jobs. Get them jobs in the communications industry and have them recognize their own, the power of their own voices. Well, I gotta be honest with you, we're still fighting that in America right now. So it's, it's really the same battle. We just need to make sure we all understand that. And just from an African perspective, I think the biggest way we will all win together Either you're a black person in the diaspora or you live in the African-American uh, community is the fact that we're going to have user testimony about uh, African-Americans who've done business on the continent testifying, which is why the testimony of Greg and Uniworld is very, very important for us as a people to say, look, we've been there to Africa, we've been to the motherland, all of the whole bullshit that we've been fed with all our, all our years is not true, and this is our testimony. And so you see uh, uh, African-Americans returning to, to Ghana, 
some to Nigeria, and they are able to testify that it's a wonderful continent and we can do business. And as a matter of fact, the symbiotic relationship that we need to take Africa to the next level is the return of the African-American continent community back to the motherland because they have the worldview, they have the knowledge, they have the expertise, and that is what Africa needs to grow at this point. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna close on that. Oh, you have, oh, oh, you gonna give me more minutes? <laughs> Adrian has a question. So it's kind of a comment, a, a comment, combination of a comment and a question. Um, okay, so the, First thing is I had an opportunity to go to the World Economic Forum in January and we actually hosted um, an Inkwell Beach um, in Davos. So if you come to the World Economic Forum in, in um, Davos in January, you come up to Snow Beach at the Shots Up Hotel, you'll have this type of forum, but it's actually outside in the snow on the side of a mountain. It's beautiful, just wear some you know, earmuffs, you'll be good. Um, but what was interesting about that experience is the conversation around Africa in a community of a group called the Africa Group. I'm making this up. They have a different name. But the majority of those people don't look like us. But they are committed to contributing back to Africa. And I was in one of the meetings and I said, please don't think what you are doing is charity because it is not, number one. You are returning what was stolen for decades. So if you change the narrative of that, that would help. And if more of us were in the conversation to let you know what you need to return to get this growth going and help our communities regain what you've stolen, that's the first point. The second point that I want to talk about is just the importance of understanding, particularly for our black Americans to understand what your heritage is and if there's a way for you to connect to figure out what that is, there's Ancestry.com that will tell you you're from the continent of Africa or you have a certain percentage. And I don't know if it's made up or what the stats are, but I had an opportunity to do AfricanAncestry.com by Gina Page who um, does that. Um, and my dad would always say, and Naeem, Naeem Akbar, I don't know if any of you know who he was, but he would say, your history identifies, unifies, inspires, and gives you a purpose. I had the opportunity to do the AfricanAncestry.com, and it, they discovered that my family, um, and this is, they trace your maternal dot, you know, and your mother's 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 line will stay the same for generations. Um, so, my people come from Sierra Leone, um, the Mende tribe. Within the Mende tribe, there's a secret society of women called Sandy. And these women are responsible for ushering in the next generation. They are, usher they are responsible for the rites of passage for the next generation. So if you can imagine when I discovered that I was from the Sandy women, um, these women who change the world and usher in the next generation. I had the ugliest of ugly cries because that is at the center and heart of what I do in creating opportunities for that next group and generation. So when people ask us, Adrian, how do you do this? I always say it has nothing to do with me and it was fortified when I discovered where I was from and my connection to the continent and the people that I am from. So I, if nothing else, I encourage black people to find out where you're from because it will just sort of reinstate your purpose, make you feel invincible and make you do the craziest of crazy things like standing up places like this in the middle of a place that they don't invite you to. But as long as you know you belong to that place and the people will come to you, then you'll continue to live and thrive. And I also say that to say, please continue to support the, <laughs> support of CCDC and, um, what we do here at Inkwell. But I just want to say thank you to the panel. Thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. You do. Adrian, thank you. And I think that's great. You know, it is in your DNA. You ain't escaping it. And I just want to end by inviting all of you, those in the room, those who will be watching post this event, put Africa on your travel list. It don't matter where you go. It's big. You can go North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa. The continent is beautiful. Make your way there. 
I think you will debunk the myths in real life in a very short period of time. Thank you for being with us. I hope it was productive use of your time. And we'll be around to take any questions or to have conversation with anyone who's interested. Thank you so much.